this is, gosh, we must be on our sixth audio. So we went through kind of an introduction to animal-human viruses. We went through all the steps in animal-human virus replication. Um, and so this one is on how viruses generate um, genetic diversity. And they have an amazing number of strategies for increasing genetic diversity. So um, some of this you, you all know already. So with our DNA viruses, remember DNA viruses use DNA polymerases to make copies of the D DNA virus genetic information. So remember DNA polymerases, they proofread, so there's a relatively low mutation rate, right? So we would, we would predict maybe like one wrong nucleotide, one mutation every maybe 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 10th um, nucleotides. But in contrast, folks, remember RNA viruses. RNA viruses have to use RNA polymerases to copy the RNA genome. And we know RNA polymerases, they can't proofread. So as a consequence, RNA polymerases are going to have a relatively high mutation rate, like one wrong nucleotide, one mutation every 10 to the 4th, 10 to the 5th mutation. So that's just this kind of um, background mutation rate in RNA viruses. So bad news, you guys, our coronaviruses are RNA viruses, so we would predict that they would have, they, they have the potential for pretty high mutation rates. And maybe this is one reason why they so easily jump from animal hosts into humans, right? And then, folks, another important um, RNA virus, influenza viruses, again, since they're RNA viruses, they're constantly undergoing these little mutations, right? And these changes can accumulate and actually lead to epidemics, little local epidemics every couple of years. So these little changes in these um, little changes in the influenza proteins, and specifically we'll be talking about the hemagglutin and the neuraminidase, these little changes in those proteins as a result of um, the high mutation rate is called antigenic drift, antigenic drift. Okay. Now, some viruses, not all, have a third way um, to generate diversity, and that's through the recombination and reassortment of genetic information from two or more different strains of a virus. So we're talking about two strains of, say, influenza A or two strains of the coronavirus, pandemic uh, coronavirus. So we'll use um, as our kind of poster viruses for genetic recombination and reassortment, influenza viruses and coronaviruses. So influenza viruses are probably the most famous for undergoing a process called reassortment. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll tackle the influenza viruses first. So um, in reassortment, we're going to get mixing of genetic information from two different um, influenza type A strains. So I on the in initial slides, you guys, I made some typos. So instead of group, this should be type A. And influenza viruses type A, these are the ones we're really worried about because they're the ones that have animal reservoirs. Um, and all the great influenza pandemics have been caused by influenza type A. So the influenza viruses, there are any viruses, and they have what's called a segmented genome. So in the type A influenza viruses, they have eight RNA segments. Each one acts like a little mini chromosome and encodes information for a different protein. So um, in the influenza A viruses, you might recall, folks, that the adhesin is called hemagglutinin. So that's encoded on one of the RNA strands. And then another important envelope protein is called the neuraminidase. And we, we didn't get into the details, but neuraminidase is important in helping influenza viruses escape from their host cells after they finish replicating. So in influenza viruses, the two envelope proteins we're really interested in are the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. Okay. Now what's fascinating, amongst these type A influenza viruses, different strains of the type A's can carry different genes for the hemagglutin and the neuraminidase proteins. And this was a mistake from the original slide, you guys. I got my numbers mixed up. So we know in nature there are at least um, 15 different hemagglutinin genes. So that means there's 15 different hemagglutinin proteins out there in nature. And so we, we would refer to the influenza strains carrying the different hemagglutin different hemagglutinins as subtypes. So there's 15 hemagglutinin subtypes. And the hemagglutinins are numbered 
from um, H1, H2, all the way up to H15. And we use these number numbers to describe the specific strain or subtype that we isolate. And then the second gene um, of interest is for another envelope protein, the neuraminidase, the N, the so-called N antigen. And there are nine different N antigens that we know of. And again, um, they're going to be numbered um, N1 through N9 subtypes. So there's nine neuraminidase um, um, antigen subtypes. And again, folks, I got those two numbers mixed up in the original post. Okay, well, who cares? <laughs> well, um, so if we look at two different um, influenza type A viruses, um, and here's, here's, here's one subtype in H1N5, and here's a second subtype, H3N2. What's wild is that some hosts can get co-infected with two different influenza virus subtypes, and furthermore, a single cell, a single host cell, can get co-infected with two different influenza subtypes. And this, we think, happens often in pigs, Pigs have their own swine influenza strains. They can get infected. They can be co-infected with avian or bird influenza strains. So this is a highly, oh, and I did that numbering wrong. It should be H5N1. Man, can I get my number straight here? Okay, so this should be H5N1. This is the highly um, virulent avian or bird influenza strain that um, has incredibly high mortality rates in humans. So let's say a pig has gotten infected with an avian influenza H5N1. And this subtype over here, folks, in H3N2, this is a kind of a classic human ad adapted um, type A um, influenza subtype. Let's say the farmer had influenza and the farmer's coughing in the pig's face. And so now the pig is co-infected with the avian influenza and the human influenza. These two viruses can infect the same um, um, cell in the respiratory tract of the pig. And so in that same cell, we're going to have all the little RNA segments from this avian influenza replicated. We'll have all the RNA segments from the human um, influenza strain replicated. And then when it comes to assembly, right, it's just random which RNA segments get packaged into the newly replicated viruses. So we would think from that one cell, the newly replicated viruses, um, some of them would have, have the parental subtype, so some of them would still be H5N1 or H3N2. But what we're really worried about is some of the newly replicated viruses will be brand new subtypes. And um, for example, you guys, um, we could have uh, one of the new viral strains could be an, oh, let's see, and I goofed this up again. Doggone it, I'm growling at myself here. Okay, I goofed this up, you guys, apologies. Okay, come on, little computer. Okay, so I gotta fix this. So you guys, so um, one of the new strains could be an H5N2, right? And another of the new strains could be an H3, and again, folks, I messed this up, I so apologize, an H3N1. So these are brand new subtypes, right? So this generation of brand new um, subtypes through the mixing of RNA between two different influenza viruses is called antigenic shift. And we are so worried that through antigenic shift we might get some brand new influenza subtypes against which a lot of humans might not have any protection, kind of like the novel coronavirus, right? And it's believed that this antigenic shift is responsible for worldwide pandemics influenza pandemics every approximately 20 years. So you might recall, folks, the last um, influenza pandemic we had was in 2009 with the so-called swine influenza, right? So um, this process, you guys, it's called reassortment, right? And it's, it's a fantastic way for influenza viruses to generate um, diversity in, 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 we could say, their offspring, right? Now, coronavirus, you guys, this I was really surprised by this because coronavirus, it is an RNA virus, but it only has a single RNA strand, right? So I was fascinated in the medical microbiology books. They say coronaviruses are really unusual because they too can undergo the process of recombination. And um, I need to look into this more, you guys, but what I'm thinking is, so um, 
just as we saw with influenza viruses, the coronaviruses, two different coronavirus strains could infect the same host and infect the same host cell, right? And so within that same host cell, we'd have an RNA strand from one coronavirus strain, and we have RNA strands from the second uh, coronavirus um, strain. And I'm, this is my guess, you guys, is much like in the process called crossing over that occurs in um, human chromosomes. For example, when our gametes, our eggs and sperm are being made, we have the, these cool crossing over events so that chromosomes can actually exchange um, pieces of chromosomal DNA. And again, this really is going to increase genetic diversity. I'm thinking maybe it's similar to crossing over in um, human gametes, that the, the two different RNA strands can cross over, switch pieces of RNA, and as a result, then you're going to end up with the newly replicated viruses will have brand new combinations of genes. And indeed, you guys, they say the coronaviruses, they have one of the biggest RNA genomes, right? So if they could kind of um, trade um, genes, you can see that that would further contribute to genetic diversity on top of them being RNA viruses and having just as a background a really high mutation rate. So no wonder these coronaviruses um, keep literally plaguing us. So we had SARS and then we had MERS and now we have the um, novel pandemic coronavirus. So gosh, what a, I mean, they're brilliant, right? But not good for us humans, that's for sure. So you guys, we always want to say, well, so why do we care, right? So why do we care that, say, influenza viruses um, can undergo antigenic drift and antigenic, sh antigenic shift? Why do we care that coronaviruses can undergo recombination. Um, HIV is another example, you guys. Um, with HIV, um, I didn't share with you in the process called reverse transcription, the HIV reverse transcriptase, it can't proofread. So it's introducing all kinds of mutations. And then when the HIV provirus, the DNA that gets stuck in our chromosomes, when it's, when it's transcribed by cellular RNA polymerase, that's going to introduce even more um, mutations. So HIV has really high mutation rate. And furthermore, this is crazy, you guys, um, HIV carries two RNA segments. They, they carry the same genes, but they could be different variants of the same gene. So almost like being a little diploid cell. So again, you can have more than one HIV perhaps infecting the same cell. And when the RNA is being copied, there's all these mistakes going on. So when the HIV is assembled, you could have two um, HIV RNA segments packaged into one virus, and the, the two RNA segments might vary, right? So that's another way of generating, almost like the reassortment that we saw in influenza. So HIV is the master of, of um, creating genetic variants. So you guys, so why do we, why as humans do we think that's not good, right? Why is that high... Um, genetic variation in influenza coronaviruses and HIV. Why do we why do we humans think that's not good? So the problem is then if we get infected say with one subtype of influenza virus or say one subtype of coronavirus or one subtype of HIV and we maybe we survive the infection and we make antibodies, we have a strong immune response against that specific strain the problem is, is if later, if we get infected with a mutant strain, a different subtype of influenza or coronavirus or HIV, a different mutant strain, it might be that our immune response against the first strain can't protect us against the mutant strain. So, so we don't develop any lifelong immunity. And that then leads to the problem of trying to develop a vaccine that would protect us against all the mutant strains, right? We haven't been able to find a vaccine for HIV just because of that problem. Um, right now, people are desperately trying to come up with a pandemic coronavirus um, vaccine, but it might be, you guys, it'll end up being like influenza vaccines. Maybe we'll have to get revaccinated every year to protect us against the, the new mutants that evolve, right? So that's going to be really interesting um, when they come up with a coronavirus vaccine. And a third reason, you guys, that we're so worried is that in these viruses that mutate and recombine um, so easily, they tend to have uh, more rapid evolution 
and spread of antiviral drug resistance. And this is, again, you guys, huge issue with HIV, big, big problem with HIV. So you guys, what we'll do is we'll stop there, and then the next audio will be hopefully really quick on um, treatment of viral infections and why they're so hard to treat. And then let's see, you guys, we'll go forward here. And then, then we'll just, we'll kind of back off you guys from so many details and we'll start looking at different types of viral infections. So we'll look at the lytic or cytocidal animal uh, viral infections. We'll look at latent viral infections. Um, and I think, and then we'll use some examples. And, and then we'll look at uh, viral infections that can um, lead to increased risk for cancer. So we'll look at oncogenic viruses. Okay, you guys, so we'll, we'll stop there.